Hello everybody. Uh, I'm showing you the last topic uh, of the uh, topics that are related to uh, harmonic excitation. Remember we started with t uh, talking about just mass spring, then we went to mass spring and damper. We looked at the general uh, case, which actually we had a template. I'm going to talk about that template that I'm going to use for this problem. And then we talked about base excitation. I, you had a few videos on that. Um, and now we want to talk about the last topic here, uh, rotating on balance. So you guys, if you recall, I talked about this uh, in class, maybe even the first lecture, I said that uh, the best example of this is uh, the example of a washing machine. When uh, you have the laundry, which is, you know, misplaced and, you know, moved to one corner of the washing machine, uh, as the frequency of the rotation uh, reaches, you know, the, um, the frequency of the system, the natural frequency of the system, and I should call this omega sub r, uh, then the system, you see the washing machine will start, you know, vibrating really uh, badly. And that's the example of the rotating on balance. Okay, so let's get started. So here I have, you know, your typical, imagine this is what's like a front loader washing machine, this one, this system. So you have, you know, your typical, you know, spring uh, damper, you know, uh, and then uh, this uh, washing machine is rotating, say, clockwise with a constant angular speed. I call it omega sub r. And then let's say the mass of the whole system is m. So the total mass is m, uppercase m I use. And then the mass of the unbalance is m0. So m0 is mass of unbalance. That m0 is already included in m, okay? So you don't add it to m uh, m zero to m. Uh, I'll show you an example later on, so to clarify that. Sometimes that's a source of confusion. Anyways, uh, before I show you how I got this system equivalent to the system below, let we we have to we need to you know review some dynamics, basic dynamics. So you guys remember in the dynamics course, if you have a rigid body, let's say a disc or a pulley or something circular rotating with a constant angular speed right that means alpha constant uh, angular acceleration is zero so what would be acceleration of a point on this um, body remember there are two components of acceleration one is the normal acceleration centripetal acceleration one is tangential you guys recall that the normal is equal to r omega square r being the distance between the uh, the center of rotation and the mass or the particle and um, that would be r omega squared always points toward the center of rotation and a sub t is r alpha but look alpha is zero it's going at constant angular speed therefore the total acceleration becomes normal acceleration and that's equal to e by the way i forgot to mention e here is the distance between the center and the unbalance. Why did we use E instead of R? Because R is already used for frequency ratio and we don't want to mix them. Uh, and E stands for eccentric. So it's an eccentric mass, you know, eccentricity. So E stands for eccentric and E is that distance. Between what? Between mass M0 and the center of rotation, that's E. Okay, so so that's your R, E, omega squared. So now imagine if you had a mass of M0 here and it has an acceleration of E omega squared, what would be the force of that? Force of that would be MA, mass is M0 and the acceleration is E omega squared. It's coming down at an angle theta. Okay. So then if you look at the y component of this force, what would be the y component of this force? Y component would be, you know, m0 e omega squared uh, times sine theta. Now, remember, omega is what? Omega is theta over t, therefore theta is equal to omega t. So look, 
instead of sine omega theta, I put sine omega t. And I'm going to call this omega omega r to be consistent with all the notations that we've used. Remember the general case, we use omega dr. Then we went to the uh, base excitation, we call omega b. Now for rotating on balance, I'm going to use omega r. Okay, so this is the force coming down vertically. Okay, so omega r in a way is your input frequency, like the way omega b was the input frequency, or omega dr in general case was the input frequency. Now look, I reduce this system to just a mass, total mass of m uppercase, and look, your force becomes this. So in a way, this is your uh, uppercase F0, guys. Instead of cosine omega drt, we have sine omega rt. Omega r and omega dr are analogous here. All right, let, let's go to the next page. I'll talk about the template that you've seen before. And I refer you to your notes. Okay, guys, if you use the template that we developed, what template am I talking about? If you go back to your notes about a week and a half before uh, the test, uh, the second exam, you guys see that if you have a typical system of, you know, mass spring damper, right? And subjected to a harmonic force of F0, cosine omega dr, remember omega dr is driving frequency, the steady state solution, meaning only the particular solution, right? With some amplitude A0, cosine omega dr, t minus phase angle phi, okay? What was important here was the, uh, the determination of A0, which is called the steady state amplitude, right? A0 is called the steady state amplitude. What is that A0? Happens to be F0 divided by what? This bracket, uh, I mean this um, radical rather. So this was a typical differential equation to this system here, right? And F0 was what? F0 was uppercase F0, this guy, divided by mass after you normalized it. Remember that? Go back to your notes if, if you want more information on that. Now look, what would be the differential equation of this system here? Differential equation of this system would be similar, except that the right-hand side would be M0 E omega squared over M sine omega RT. Don't let sine and cosine bother you here. doesn't matter. Sine and cosine are the same thing. Okay, but this becomes now your lower, lower case F0. Uh, this actually becomes lower case F0 because I already did the uh, normalizing uh, this guy and that's why you see the M here. All right, so look, if we now having our F0, I can plug it in here and find my steady state amplitude. So if we assume a steady state solution for our new topic as some amplitude X, sine omega rt minus phi because the remember the input was a sine wave that's why i use sine by the way phi is not going to change interestingly enough and phi is not important i'm not going to even bother with that okay so x this amplitude amplitude of what amplitude of the steady state solution steady state amplitude amplitude just like a0 a0 and x are the same thing is f0 what is f0 this is f0 right here, put it here and divide it by, it's just instead of omega dr here, put omega r. Okay, so that's your steady state amplitude. Let's go to the next page. So if you rearrange this equation, uh, you could write it in terms of frequency ratio. I forgot to mention that we said now if r is equal to frequency ratio is the omega r, like omega dr or omega b, divided by omega in natural frequency. It could be shown that uh, the equation for steady state amplitude becomes that. You could also put this in the non-dimensional form by putting this down here and put x over here. So what I did, I showed you a graph of this non-dimensional. Remember, this, this is the non-dimensional amplitude, right? You guys remember that. It's always a good idea to put it in the non-dimensional form. And uh, you've seen these plots, similar plots like this. If you plot this non-dimensional amplitude as a function of frequency ratio, look what happens. We start at zero, and for any value of zeta, you could get a plot. But the interesting thing is uh, about this uh, situation is for rotating on balance is that for any value of zeta, right, as r approaches infinite, in other words, as r gets large, right, all the... Uh, 
the non-dimensional amplitude, the non-dimensional amplitude approaches one. You see that? You get one. So that's important. I'm going to show you an example soon on that. Okay, uh, and then I just uh, wanted to, you know, make a note here that actually maximum non-dimensional amplitude ha happens in this case at the larger value of R. This is, uh, of course, I'm showing you the important uh, frequency ratio of 1. So it does get large at R equal 1, but it's not the largest. It happens actually at R larger than 1. In fact, we have, we've done something like this in the class. If you take the derivative of this, after you put it in the non-dimensional form, in other words, when you put this as xm over m0e, if you take the derivative of this guy with respect to r, which is basically the derivative of this, it could be shown that maximum happens at this frequency ratio, actually, which is larger than 1, and that's exactly what I showed you. This is larger than 1. It uh, happens at frequency ratio larger than 1. Okay, uh, also the maximum amplitude, meaning this guy, for each case, for each value of zeta, maximum what? Non-dimensional amplitude. Be careful, guys. This is non-dimensional amplitude. The actual amplitude is x. This is the actual amplitude. This is the non-dimensional amplitude. Becomes 1 over 2 zeta square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Okay, so I suggest you guys look at this video a couple of times, maybe more than a couple of times. Try to write things down on your own, and I'm going to come back and hopefully show you some examples. And these are, uh, these are lectures for both Tuesday and Thursday of this coming week. The week of, I believe, uh, what's today? Today is Sunday, 22nd, so the week of 23rd. Okay, guys, thanks for watching and listening.